they, uh, they say the planet saw us of the Lord, I've forgotten which, moves in mysterious ways, but uh, apparently I've got a bad throat, something's concocted here, either to silence me or not, but I've got some medicinal knowledge here, so we'll pop that down for the moment. Instant fossilization. Now, the what a subject. Everyone's talked about planet configurations and the damage they do. Uh, this could be one of the subjects I think we should tap into far more than we do, but instant fossilization. Uh, now, around the world, pl living plants and animals are being petrified into solid rock in violent paroxysms of nature. Their end was agonizing and instantaneous as witnessed by their contorted death rows. Now, there are plant let's... fossils and there are animal fossils. How do you turn this piece of wood into this fossilized piece of wood, which has high calcium, silicon, and other mineral content, or even into this fossilized piece of wood, which has very high iron content? I'm not going to the next slide. So let's look at four examples of petrification, and we're, we'll come to the difference between petrification and just mere fossilization soon. Here's some... Um, ammonites are like squids, but in a shell, swimming along soft-bodied, and now we see them fossilized within this beach. They're associated with the Jurassic Age and can be anything up to six foot across. So let's go, that's the first example. Let's go to another one. I wanted you to actually uh, see the reality of these things. They're long, as though these have come off the tree and they're This is But how do you explain this? They're all cut off, not ripped apart, cut. And it's solid rock. Solid rock. Solid rock. Amazing. That's example two. So this is the reality of petrification. Should I get Here's the next one. Uh, knob here okay. in the area, and he was leveling that down. South oh. Dakota. It took maybe 10 feet off the top of the knob, and okay. the bulldozer operator looked behind him, and there were big bones sticking out everywhere he'd been. Right, and it's an incredible sight. Now, we're talking about roughly, um, I've got to think in terms of feet, where it's about 100 foot by about 80 foot, something like about that. About 125 by 100. Yeah. It's and, kind of an ellipse. And although this is a mammoth site, in actual fact, there's a number of species in situ right. here, isn't there? Right. The mammoth kind of dwarf everything else. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> that's what everyone loves, the mammoths, don't they? <laughs> and notice the layering of the limestone. Now, we'll come back to this anyway. Here's the... Fourth example, and this is my favourite. The, the northwest. Whoops, sorry. Well, what have I done? Yeah. It's the Northwest Mineral Gallery we've come to, and you've got not only petrified trees to show us, but some really interesting concretations containing. You tell us about. It. Yes, Peter. These. Um what you're going to see in, inside of the museum here are fossilized crabs. They're crabs. actually soft-bodied fossils, which are found inside of concretions. So when we say concretion, we're talking about a round egg-shaped rock, mm -hmm. and it's solid rock. Yes. And within that rock, when you break them open, there is a crab, mm -hmm. right? And that crab is actually rock as well. Is that right? Yes. Fossilized. So. Okay, sorry, just wanted to make sure everyone understood. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, concretions are the most popular and known kind of concretion are, are round rocks. There yeah. are other kinds, but um, the ones most of us know are, are round rocks, and they, are, they often form around the nucleus of a fossil. A little bit of rock, a little, I mean, a little bit of shell, maybe yeah. a little yeah. piece of um, leaf or something. Yeah. In this case, we have the whole crab. Yeah. And the crab uh, has a lot of his anatomy. It's all right there. You'll be able to see his, his uh, orifice. You can see um, the spikes on his... Um, his back, yeah, but also back. as okay. I understand his claws. Right, you'll you be able to see... them out, the minute yes. detail of the whole skeleton. Yes. 
So that's amazing, isn't it? So what do these petrified organic fossils, remember they were actually living, have in common? Their end was instantaneous and dramatic. Their chemical composition changed. It changed from a carbon water base to silicon whatever. But the unanswered question, what pungent force of nature changed their chemical composition whilst they were in their death throes? Let's look for some answer. Now, conventional geology counts time as a slowly moving tool that leached their bodies, all the chemicals were taken out, and replaced them with the carbon with silicon and calcium. That's the conventional wisdom. But the rapid decay of biological matter, in my opinion, makes a nonsense of this theory. What then is the answer? Now, let's go outside the uh, scientific square but before we do, I just want to get some of these uh, terminologies sorted out. There's fossilization, there's petrification. Now, fossilization can preserve tissue and particularly bones, for instance, uh, Alaska and Siberia, Antarctica, the, uh, the in, within coal and the peat, Snowmass Colorado is one I've visited where they've got mastons and mammoths, etc. They're, they're preserved, but they're not actually changed to rock. Uh, petrification is a subset where the original carbon-like material is either replaced or transmuted, remember that term, transmuted, to different compounds of silicon, calcium, iron, aluminium, etc. In other words, they're turned to rock. They're not just preserved. Now, although fossilization generally is undoubtedly the result of cataclysmic events, as you know, we can read about in Velikovsky, etc., petrification tends to occur either in a bolus, such as we saw with Larry Ackenbroad in South Dakota, or along coastlines. Now, I'm not sure how we can explain this, but let's try. So there you are, petrification would seem to magnify the catastrophic event and actually transmute elements and compounds. I suspect, I suspect this is a result of powerful electromagnetic forces that have centralised in a certain area. They're not necessarily over a broad area such as the normal catastrophe that does fossilise things, but petrification tends to be in secluded areas. Not sure why, but anyway. Often these, um, so there we go. We've got some examples here. There's the Hot Springs ones, Romney Marsh in Australia, the Jurassic Coast we saw before, and Diamond Bay, which you'll see later. Okay, the causes of petrification. Now, I noted before um, we should search in other places apart from scientific endeavour. And mythology, um, from Renz van der Slay to Dave and um, Wall, etc., etc., holds a lot of the key to this, in my opinion. Uh, they're witness to catastrophic destruction. Now, Georges Cuvier, who visited the Americas around about 1800 or so, around the time of the French Revolution and uh, the American War of uh, Independence, um, investigated a lot of, apart from looking, he was a paleontologist, apart from looking at bones and things like that, he was extremely interested in um, local or um, the Indian mythology. And uh, Adrian Meyer studied this a lot and followed up on uh, Georges Cuvier's efforts and she advocates, as a lot of this myth Indian mythology talks about, the cosmic thunderbolt as the weapon of choice in this megafaunal destruction. These so let's just listen to this. Monstrous creatures this must have Meyer. preyed upon early humans and, and that the creator then wanted to make the earth safe for for the new human beings, so, they got rid of them. so the creator then killed them with uh, a sort of cosmic lightning bolts, something beyond uh, 
uh, just ordinary so lightning. So it wasn't just a description of normal everyday no. lightning, so to speak. No, this was, a, this was a, a massive destruction of these creatures. And it's actual fact that did happen. The megafauna are now extinct. They so did. Something did happen, yes. whatever it was. Yes, and the, and the, the, the early colonists describe um, the, uh, the Americas as a land of covered with bones. I mean, there, everywhere you went, there were there were skeletons emerging or uh, um, partially petrified. Yeah. And apparently, and even George Cuvier came out. Uh, Georges Cuvier, the father of paleontology yeah, yeah. in Paris, he was um, extremely interested in in the stories that were told by the Native Americans because he was tr at that time developing his theory of extinction and evolution. Yeah, which was quite different to, uh, let's say, Darwin yeah. and some of those. I mean, Darwin essentially is saying that it's taken millions of years to develop, whereas George Cuvier is uh, he, more or less saying something, number of extinctions have he, occurred. He thought there must have been um, a series of catastrophes, mm. uh, whether they were floods or, or, or volcanic or something like that. I think he he settled on floods, but but he was very interested in the in the disaster scenarios uh, that the Native Americans had in their oral cultures, explaining the disappearance and mass. Whoops. Okay, so let's let's look at a couple of these. Um, there's here these mythologies from the uh, Native Americans. And here's one cited by Udo's and Oris around about the creator. We'll get to Kyle is saying. But the Lakota Nation had sent hunting tribes down here for many, many years. And they had a different interpretation on what had caused the fossilization of these great beasts. Carly repeats the traditions of the first Americans. The creator sang a song of destruction and set down fierce thunderbirds to wage a great battle against the humans and the giant animals. They fought for a very long time because the evil humans and the animals had become very powerful and neither could gain an advantage. Finally, at the height of the battle, the Thunderbirds sent down their most powerful thunderbolts all at once. The fiery blasts shook the entire world, toppling mountain ranges and setting forests and prairies ablaze. The flames leapt up to the sky in all directions, sparing only a few people at the highest peaks. It was so hot that the world's lakes boiled up and dried before their eyes. Even the rocks burned up red hot and the giant animals and the people burned up where they stood. A great flood followed, and when the survivors went out, they found bleached bones of the giant animals in mud and rocks all over the world. They're still found today in the Dakota Badlands, but can we believe these bizarre stories of mass destruction? Mythology from the Lakota Nation tells us precisely how this destruction happened, and it was not so long ago. Now, what event was that? We're not sure. You know, you go back through the uh, mass destructions of the Velikovskian eras, you know, from around about 2000 BC before right up to uh, 500 BC. So we can tie that in, though, with a lot of the Greek mythology. And uh, Ren Zanderslay is very good at, at that, as are many of the people in the EU. So um, let's... Let's look at this, uh, particularly the Gorgons. Earthquakes and volcanoes routinely emit flashing transparent plasmoids, merging like giant bubbles out of the ground. These chaotic electromagnetic formations come in many shapes and colours and can travel at supersonic speed while seamlessly passing through or, alternatively, boring through obstructions. Plasmoids wreak fire and destruction, and according to Egan Back, they have burnt down cities and tunneled through mountains. And in great fear, the ancients called these ground-emerging destroyers Gorgons. Hesiod was writing they were around about 900 for BC. The petrification of rock under the sea. Now it would seem that the Gorgons may have been active in Australian Aboriginal mythology. 
verbal records and dance traditions recorded these demonic plasmoids at many sites and in various forms. Their rainbow serpent was responsible for carving river systems, that's Lichtenberg scars, on the face of the earth and even held responsible for building mountains and forming lakes. Fantasy, you might ask? Well, I don't believe it was fantasy. Let's go on to the next. So here we go. We're in search of the causes of petrification. We've dealt a little bit about mythology. What about going to the scientific side of things and plasma physics? Um, Anthony Pratt certainly is an advocate of giant plasma discharges that shaped history. To him, this mythology could be simulated in his laboratory. But what evidence do we have that electrical phenomena can cause elements to transmute? E.g. Uh, water, and I say water so I think about that, to calcium. What tool of nature fossilised these once watery marine ammonites, the ones along the Jurassic coast? We have a powerful clue. Now there's two. There's Eric Milton and um, some work Wall did uh, at the Telstra Laboratories uh, years ago, which gives you an indication of the power of electrical discharge. About the conversion of the wood to rock. Wall again demonstrates the creation of fulgurites by a powerful electric discharge. Yeah. There we go. Right there in that light. Keep right there. What is this wall? This is a uh, fulgurite. It's uh, fused silica, which uh, follows the path of the uh, lightning or uh, electrical discharge. Was this how these trees were petrified? Further evidence comes from Canada. E.R. Milton describes his examination of a petrified tree trunk in Alberta. The piece was pure, clean silica inside. It was coated with a rougher, opaque crust of partially fused sand. The tree whose stump was petrified was alive five years ago. After the tree was cut down to accommodate the right of way for a new power transmission line, an accidental break allowed a live high voltage wire to contact several tree stumps in the ground. The power was cut off within hours of the break. All of the tree roots which contacted the broken wire were fossilised. Obviously, electricity can metamorphosize matter quickly. Look at this. Around about this is 60, Lesbos 70 again. foot long, solid rock, but just clearly amazing. a tree. You can see how this is actually still wood, part of it, but otherwise it's been turned to rock. A substance a bit like marble. Here's another example, open mines in Australia, white cliffs. We're just going to go down one of the open mines and see some interesting things. These are essentially limestone caves carved deep into the hillsides. This is where they find the opals. But what really intrigues me are these Lichtenberg figures you see in front of you. I interpret these as telluric currents coming deep from within the bowels of the earth 
and thrusting upwards under some dramatic geophysical crisis. And these are where the opals are found. This current coming up through the Earth seems to have transmutated the calcium into some sort of ferrous compound. Notice all the red. And at other times, under different conditions, it's formed opals. And the opals we're interested in are these shells and various other forms of life that have been totally converted and opalized. Some scientists take this as a sign of very old age. But are there other explanations? Let's continue our investigations. All this red colored rock pebbles scattered over miles and miles of countryside. I suspect CJ Ransom with his experiments in creating concretations in his laboratory may have been very interested in these rounded pebbles. They bear a remarkable resemblance to the Martian blueberries. Is this yet again some evidence of a major electrical discharge event? In fact, uh, my colleague in uh, the US has done experiments on material like Martian soil, and he has created the blueberries that they found. Oh, OK. Yeah. So he's done that in the lab. And yet the, the blueberries themselves are a mystery at present to uh, the planetologists who are studying the surface so of the Earth. So we can enlighten them. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting that you say that uh, there are magnetic reversals uh, found at the site because that indicates a change in electrical currents. Uh, basically, you don't get a magnetic field without an electric current. Oh, that's a precursor too. So that's, yeah. yeah, that's an indicator that we're looking at an electrical phenomenon. And at certain places, for instance, Lake Mungo, because after a, a magnetic variation, and the rock turns molten, it actually collects the signal of the magnetic field. It was found that the magnetic field was up to eight times what it is today. That means a powerful electric current flow. Could that be a possible indicator of petrification here? But what about, here's another question though. This is where we start to think hopefully a bit laterally and I don't have a solution but I'll propose a couple. What about the medium the fossils were actually embedded in? And in the cases we're talking here, it's water. The ammonites, the crabs, possibly, well, one would think so, certainly, etc. Um, they're in a bolus, and it's a volumetric disaster. So, if let's let's have a thought about how, if a crab's in water, which obviously, and the fishes were in water, and the mammoths had fallen into a watery pit, could the calcium change? to water, big question. And uh, certainly it's contentious. But if you look at the chemistry uh, here, we've got H2O, two elements, hydrogen and oxygen, with a combination of 10 protons, two hydrogen uh, protons and eight oxygen. Calcium, the basic stuff of limestone, is, uh, has a proton count of uh, double that, 20. This is twice that of water. All that is theoretically needed to convert the water to calcium is an abundance of neutrons to match the lack of ones in the, the hydrogen, which is only has one proton but no neutrons. Is that feasible? You know, the chemistry is there. I mean, uh, some people could look at uh, H2O as an isotope of, um, of calcium, possibly. And Russian studies of uh, lightning discharges have shown that Neutrons are promulgated during a lightning storm. So neutrons could be involved in this. So it's a possibility. I, but something tells me if the fish and the crabs are in water and that's, and that's in rock later on, how the hell did that happen unless the water itself has been transmuted together with the bodies? And there you have the periodic tables, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. We know them all. And how close they are, you know, only one, for instance, nitrogen and oxygen 
only one um, proton away. Silicon, the most abundant um, element on Earth, if I remember rightly. They're all fairly close together, so there's a lot of scope, and we still don't understand how elemental change can occur. It certainly can do, though. And, uh, but how can it? Um, plasmoid research by Matsumoto and a number of other people shows that when you put electrodes into a certain solutions, the damaged electrons can produce new, totally different elements in that solution, and also plasmoids. Let's have a look at a little bit of this. On July the 19th, 2012, an eruption occurred on the sun. A moderately powerful now solar this, in my opinion, can mimic some exploded on the sun's Aboriginal lower right mythology. hand, Let's have a look at it, light and radiation. Next came a CME, which shot off to the right, out into space, and then the sun treated viewers to one of its dazzling magnetic displays, a phenomenon known as coronal rain. This is a little bit about the Kimberley Diamond region, where a giant barramundi jumped out Could and came back in, diamonds on either side of it. that other icon of Australian mythology, the Rainbow Serpent. The Rainbow Serpent is cited by the Aboriginals as the creator of geological formations such as rivers, mountain building and gorge cutting. But the other real question is, could these very same processes create diamonds? Plasmoid research in cold fusion suggests that this might be replicated. In laboratory experiments, with various electrodes immersed in differing solutions, we can witness cold fusion. This creates new elements around damaged parts of the electrode. The electrical current flow forces many plasmoids to emerge from these very electrodes. Some, quite curiously, look totally like comets, with their tails this and is angled... Very subject. interesting to me, at least. <laughs> Claims by Wal Thornhill that electrical phenomena are scalable gives us pause to think. The emerging plasmoids then leap and wander across sensitive gel plates. Work from Matsumoto and others show how they crater and form tracking lines. In fact, they perform exactly as the legend told to me by Aboriginal elder Murray Butcher. He tells the story of the willy wagtail bird that leapt and darted along rivers boring water holes. He insists these are actually facts, not fiction. Large plasmoids from volcanoes and earthquakes, these are other electromagnetic phenomena, have been shown to sculpt the earth as they bore and tunnel at great velocities. They often convert to the tightly related tornado. Even tsunamis are produced when giant plasmoids explode. But the plasmoid's ability to create new elements whilst emitting light is an area still at a pioneering stage of our understanding. Where on Earth these major electrical discharges came from that completely changed the geology of the landscape. And what's more, what could possibly have caused the electrical fossilization of not only giant wombats, but mammoths and other megafauna in this period of the Earth's development. Both of us agree that some form of Pratt instability led to the final discharge causing these geological effects and I believe electric fossilization. This is not only backed up by mythology with petroglyph carvings but also by a large amount of mythology not only Aboriginal but North American and around the world from Zeus's thunderbolts to the Aboriginal lightning brothers. Aboriginal mythology and tradition is all about cosmological warfare in the plasma of space. Comets are mentioned, meteorites, planets in disturbed motion, 
great flashes of thunderbolts from outer space, earthquakes, tsunamis covering the land, people going mad, huge oral traditions. But one thing is plain in Aboriginal mythology. It's not myth, it's fact. Every word that's breathed by these oral traditions actually happened here in Australia. I'll just pause that for a second. Um, I hope I can go on with this. This is Diamond Point Bay and where I live, Victoria. And Australia is spelt wrongly, but we won't worry about that. See this big uh, hole here? <laughs> This is where a giant wombat, if you don't know what a wombat is, it's like a badger. I think you have badgers here, I'm not sure. But it was the size of a Volkswagen. It, it was fossilised, petrified. And this amazing area, it, it only came out last year. But um, hopefully I can play this. Um, well, it might go on to the next one. And on we go. Now, electric fossilisation in the Carolina Bays. I decided to include this because you're finding out that is again a possibility of things that have happened that have transmutated or created elements. So I won't bore you with reading all that out. Let's see some of the guff about it. Um, this is Rick Firestone from Berkeley National Laboratories. He uh, ran the first cyclotron in the US and uh, is... Uh, the current table of isotopes expert. He knows his stuff. Had to say about these mass destructions. We discovered that there was a parallel line of research where they had been studying the disappearance at that same time of mammoths and bears and horses and a whole and, and, and bison. Yeah. All of these animals virtually disappeared from just that region. So wow. it was kind of like a dress rehearsal for what happened 13,000 years ago. So he, uh, he did a, a survey of the Carolina Bays, and the Carolina Bays, you'll see about them in a moment, but there are thousands of depressions all on the east coast of the US and up into Canada, I believe, and even down this far in some cases. But let's see what he found out. The remarkable study of the Carolina Bay system by Berkeley nuclear physicist Rick Firestone stimulates even further speculation on the production of diamonds. The Carolina Bays is a vast system of shallow elliptical depressions whose origin is highly debatable. Some claim meteorite storms have their shallowness and lack of debris precludes this. Others speculate wind-borne dramas from past eras. However, plasmoids may be involved in the base production. Importantly, it should be noted the Carolina Bays accompany and bank along Lichtenberg River systems. EU theory suspects Lichtenberg River systems are ancient electromagnetic discharge lines along and I suspect beneath the Earth's surface. So, uh, what did he conclude? Well, uh, he was laborious in a lot of these studies, driving around hand and foot, analysing them and taking things back to the laboratory. But he found they contained large concentrations of nanodiamonds. And we're talking about creating new elements here. This is not outside of these small craters. It's actually within them. Outside's totally different. Uh, nanodiamonds... Um, Iridium, helium-3, fullerenes, that's buckyballs, carbon glass, hollow spirals and magnetic particles. Could an electrical discharge or an emerging plasmoid, such as we saw uh, with the electrodes, uh, plasmoid instability possibly create diamonds? And we're talking here about transmutation. So is this a, a vehicle of transmutation? If plasmoids did actually create the Carolina Bays, is this an indication of they could do other things like petrification? And uh, some backup stuff here. 
that I was curious. I actually went to Calabria, but I couldn't find these. See these round craters? They were penciled into the stage. Around about 1560, I think it was, there were huge earthquakes killing thousands upon thousands. And one of the things that happens uh, with earthquakes and volcanoes, as we know, plasmoids emerge out of the earth on mountains. It's well documented. And these there, so they're fairly similar to the Carolina Bays, but in a smaller way. So um, Lewis Hissink, um, a geologist involved in diamond exploration in Australia, said, said to me, he said, you know, some of the cherished theories we hold may be quite wrong. And that's a typical EU statement if I've never heard, ever heard one. Get it right. Here's they're, a summary. They're not sort of dead and perished. They're actually living at the time of fossilisation. They're instantaneously, you believe, frozen, if you like, in time. Yes. What, uh, what these fossils dramatically illustrate, even though yeah. concretions with soft body fossils are found all over the world, these will dramatically illustrate to you that uh, these are not creatures which are disarticulated. They yeah. appear to have undergone no breakdown and no decomposition. They are in very lifelike positions, and you may have some of your own favorites, but um, some other examples of soft-bodied fossils were found by, uh, that are in, in particular moments of life, seemingly fossiled, fa fossilized and turned to stone. Our, uh, uh, there was a plesior plesiosaurus that was giving birth in, okay. in Holtzmaden, Germany. When she was seemingly fossilized, the famous paleontologist Charles Walcott also found concretions which had uh, specimens of jellyfish which, which were actually dividing into two when they were fossilized. Wow, so it is an instantaneous As thing. It would seemingly be so. They display all of the kind of characteristics that you would expect from an electrical discharge uh, okay. formation of these types of stone orbs. Okay. It's got the layering, it's got the, it's got the equi equatorial bulge, if you yeah. like, it's got um, the polar markings. And, uh, and it's wonderful because I think that the work that C.J. Ransom is doing kind of gives us an alternative, uh, unified view of how this uh, type of, of geologic formation, which is really found all over the United States, all over the world, could be, have, could have been formed not by a patchwork of explanations depending on the area, but really we can see the, the qualities that we see in concretions in, in electrically formed, okay. um, in electrically formed stone. That's Paulina West, by the way. Um. So here we are, let's start summing up. Now, here's a classic, a petrified fish turned to rock in rock, eating another fish, caught at a moment of death. Quite staggering. So let's sum up what we've gone through. Is instant fossilization an electrical phenomena? And I think we've, we can never say positively because we haven't actually seen it happen, but let's go through some of the things. Mytholo mythology states unequivocally the plasmoids, and I was talking to Ren Vanslay the other day, he's coming up with a lot of research he's done in mythology that brings in not only electrical discharges, such as Zeus, but plasmoid formation. So I'm waiting to see on that. But, uh, and celestial thunderbolts cause petrification. CJ Ransom and others have shown the ability of electrical discharge to form concretations, it would appear that the medium in which the petrification has occurred has also dramatically changed, and no one seems to get that bit. That's so important to me. You know, if something's in rock, how can it be in the middle of rock? I mean, if that was molten, it would have just vaporised it, surely. But it's not. It's intact, and it's therefore, has the rock, has the water turned to rock as well? Big question to me, anyway. Elemental change occurs during the process. Some fossilization, you get marginal change. You certainly get uh, mammoth bones preserved in muck and peat and ice, but in, particularly in petrification, it's turned to rock. Elemental change, compound change. The change, and this is an important part, is very rapid, and theories that endorse long periods of transition the classic theories do not fit 
the fact that biological matter deteriorates very quickly if not preserved by some means. And that about sums it up. Thank you.